This is KGW News at Noon. Coming up on KGW News at Noon, President Biden, uh, rather, um, the man at the center of a police standoff that led to an apartment fire in Portland's St. John's neighborhood last Friday is expected to be in court today. His name is Brent Lusted. Hello, I'm Christine Pitawanich. Thank you so much for joining us for the news at noon. Lusted was arrested and charged with arson, unlawful use of a weapon, and menacing after a string of events unfolded Friday. Here's what happened. Police got called to the Shrunk Riverview Tower apartment complex. That was where uh, there were reports of a man who was apparently throwing things off his balcony. When police knocked on his door, they say he answered while holding what appeared to be a rifle. That is when things started to escalate. We've uh, heard multiple shots fired from inside the apartment. Police now say it was a realistic looking BB gun. The whole thing prompted police to order neighbors to stay inside. Then just before five o'clock, things took another turn after investigators say Lusted set the balcony on fire. It all came to a close when firefighters put out the flames and police arrested him. Lusted is due to appear in Multnomah County Court this afternoon. And today, investigators need your help to solve a murder. And now there's also a $2,500 Crime Stoppers reward for any information leading to an arrest. 25-year-old Tyler Turpin was found shot to death near Northeast 54th and Fremont two years ago. His family is asking anyone who knows what happened to contact Crime Stoppers. People can also remain anonymous when giving information. To Salem now, where Oregon lawmakers are talking about a new bill that would increase consequences for street racers. The legislation is currently in committee with no hearings scheduled just yet. But Catherine Cook spoke with one mom who is still waiting to get justice for her daughter who was killed in what police say was a street race. Fiery wreckage burning on North Marine Drive. It marks the spot where two cars crashed late Saturday night. Police say street racing was involved. Three people went to the hospital. One of them died. Police say that driver was part of the event. This marks the sixth traffic-related death of this year and just the latest involving illegal street racing in Portland. Last August, 26-year-old Ashley McGill was killed while waiting for a bus. She was standing at Northeast 133rd and Stark when police say a street racer lost control and hit her. The driver took off. For months, Ashley's mom waited for justice. Trying to, you know, find out whatever I could find out and not finding out too much. Then on Thursday, police arrested 35-year-old Kenneth Freeman for second-degree manslaughter. She had a family and uh, that, you know, that was my baby. He hasn't, she gave me any reason to, you know, to, to believe he has any, like, it remorse for what he did because he didn't even turn himself in. But um, I don't, you know, I don't hate him. I, I, I pray for him, but um, I, don't, I don't hate him. Many street races and takeovers are organized by individuals and advertised on social media. In Salem, lawmakers are considering a new bill designed to make laws tougher on those who organize street races and takeover events. If Senate Bill 615 passes, first offenders could get a maximum of 364 days in prison and or a $6,200 fine. Repeat offenders within a five-year period could face up to five years in prison and or a $125,000 fine. The bill would also modify the charge of reckless driving to include speed racing activities. Something, anything to try and bring an end to scenes like this. Catherine Cook, KGW News. Okay, let's get to meteorologist Rod Hill now in the Weather Center. So, Rod, what are we looking at for the rest of the day? Well, uh, we continue to see quite a few showers on the radar. And if you've been out and about, you probably notice the skies go from kind of bright, a sunbreak, and then you see some darker clouds on the horizon. Uh, so the pattern is this. See the white? That's snow over the coast range. Snow over the Cascades. Both mountain ranges continuing under a winter storm warning at this point through it uh, looks like Wednesday morning around 10 o'clock. The rest of us here in the valley, it's been mainly rain. I do want to zoom in a little bit. 
Uh, all right, so the radar just now showing the West Hills have warmed up a little bit, but it was showing a pretty good little band of rain, at least up near Germantown Road, one of the higher elevation spots of the West Hills. I think the snow level, generally speaking, is going to hold for sticking snow near to just above 1,000 feet throughout the afternoon hours. A reminder with the winter storm warnings in the mountains, it is tough or slow going. There's a very snow covered, buried Highway 26, in fact, up on Mount Hood with a temperature of 25. I mean, ODOT's out continually plowing the roads and keeping them passable, but that's pretty slow going. We are above freezing at 1,400 feet in the coast range. It was down to 33, now we're at 36 degrees. So you can see there's a snow roadside, but the highway itself is staying kind of slushy once you get up above 1,000 feet. Downtown Portland, we've had passing rain showers. We were in the low 40s this morning. Right now we're at 44, so temperatures are holding steady up and down the valley and also at the coast, which is what we thought. And it is rain out through the gorge. You can see the dials at 45. So for this afternoon, snow in the mountains, scattered showers, heavy at times, maybe some hail, maybe a rumble of thunder with some sun breaks here in the valley. I'll keep us in the mid 40s at 4 o'clock. Now tonight we get into a snow shower mix already 38 at 8 o'clock. Tonight actually could end up being one of the better chances to see a dusting of snow where you live. We'll have that forecast coming up. Okay, thank you, Rod. Postal workers are taking a stand, demanding better pay and benefits. This is video from a rally that they held yesterday in front of the East Portland Post Office on Southeast 7th between Taylor and Yamhill. The post office is really short staff right now and it, you know they're working letter carriers way too long you know going over 12 hours and the union's fighting it with grievances the workers union is in the middle of contract negotiations with the u.s postal service their current agreement runs out in may $800,000 in federal funding is coming to Northeast Portland's Albina neighborhood. The nonprofit Albina Vision Trust will be getting the money. It intends to use it to revitalize the area through housing, green spaces, and transportation services. Over the course of decades, people in the historically black Albina neighborhood were displaced for various reasons, one of which included the construction of I-5. Oregon Congressman Earl Blumenauer called the $800,000 award a step toward, quote, righting the historic wrongs. Okay, now we want to talk about the greater Idaho movement. It is gaining some momentum in the Idaho legislature. So this movement calls for a redrawing of the Oregon-Idaho border. And if it happened, most of eastern Oregon would become part of a much larger Idaho. We want to be clear, though, from the get-go, this is still a long way from happening and would need both states to be on board. Eleven counties have already voted to begin talks. They're the ones that are going to be red. But in May, voters in Will Wallowa County and Green will vote on whether to join the movement. There you see what I'm talking about. That's a third of all Oregon counties. The next step is getting the state legislatures involved, which Idaho has done and Oregon Republicans are trying to do. Last week, Idaho's House voted in favor of starting discussions. In Oregon, Republicans are proposing their own bill, but it's unlikely it'll go anywhere in the democratically held legislature. Still, some are saying this is no joke. I think many people in the urban areas, particularly in Portland, dismiss this as a bunch of cranks out in eastern Oregon. The fundamental question that you've got to ask is, why are these people so angry? And this is visceral, real anger. So if both states agreed to talk about moving the border, it would still take an act of Congress to make it happen.